Welcome to numerical methods. Yeah, we have started a section on the valuation of Bermudan options. And Bermudan options were then the motivation for yeah, what is sometimes called American Monte Carlo, which is how do we actually calculate or estimate a conditional expectation operator in a Monte Carlo simulation. So this topic here is about estimating the conditional expectation operator in a Monte Carlo simulation. So we already understood the problem by looking here at one, say, unfeasible method that is to perform a re-simulation. So with your Monte Carlo sample path, you, know, you arrive at this point, and now you would like to have the conditional expectation of the values that you observe here at, say, time t2, conditional to where you have been arrived uh, or what has happened up to time t1. So this requires, if you would like to have the conditional expectation conditional to where you have arrived here, this requires that you then perform an additional Monte Carlo simulation. So all these sample paths that originate in that Con condition point. Yeah. And you see, there is some curse of uh, dimensionality. So we also saw that this is a little bit linked to the filtration. So if you have, for example, just the repetition of just having two events, yeah, it goes up or down, uh, you see that the filtration becomes finer and finer as events are uh, happening. Yeah? So first you just can distinguish here the red and the green, then you can distinguish the red, the yellow, the green, and the blue, and so on. And every time step here adds another possibility. So that was a little bit the problem. And let's have a small repetition so the first step yeah towards getting a good approximation for the conditional expectation in the monte carlo simulation is to understand that we can interpret the conditional expectation as a function of a random variable and this actually yeah is motivated or already suggested here by our figure 44 which is this figure of the re simulation if you would just condition on where you have arrived at this time t1, then the conditional expectation is a function of this value here. Yeah? So you now just take the value where is the starting value and your conditional expectation is a function of where you have started. So this re-simulation motivates that we can interpret our conditional expectation operator. So here's our conditional expectation operator, which we apply on some random variable. Yeah? So in our case, it is the value of maybe some financial product yeah, observed in time t2 divided by the number of observed in time t2. Some random variable here, the v divided by n of t2, which is not necessarily ft1 measurable. And I would like to calculate the conditional expectation conditional to the information I have in t1. And this can be interpreted as the conditional expectation condition to a random variable z. Yeah? So where z is, of course, an ft1 measurable a random variable. So the uh, random variable z yeah, generates this um, sigma field um, ft1. However, now comes an important part. If you look at this identity, it can hold even if the sigma field that is generated is smaller than ft1. The reason is that I just calculate the condition expectation of such a random variable. Yeah, before I come to this, yeah, which is on the next slide, what is the interpretation of the stuff that we are doing? Yeah, conditional expectation of such a random variable conditional to 
the sigma field ft1, the information we have in t1, this is a random variable. Yeah? So the conditional expectation operator is a random variable. So a map of a random variable to a random variable. And this random variable, okay, if I evaluate it in omega, is actually now, yeah, the conditional expectation conditional to z, yeah, evaluated on some sample path omega. So I can interpret this as the conditional expectation of this conditional to the z, where the random variable z has the value z of omega. So my z of omega would be this uh, starting point in this little B simulation graph. So if this z is now the value of this starting point, say, let's call it little z, the little z is now my z of omega, so then this is just a function of little z. So I have here my conditional expectation is just a function of this value where I start my re-simulation. So conditional expectation of my random variable v of t2 divided by n of t2, conditional that my random variable z has this value. Well, in the general case, the z should be such that it generates the full sigma field here. Yeah? So Z should contain all the information. So in the general case, my Z contains all the information. This means if I take the inverse of Z applied to the Borel sigma algebra, then this is equal to FT1. However, since we are only interested in the uh, conditional expectation of this random variable there, it may happen that Z can be smaller. So this now refers to the dimension of the random variable Z. So what is the dimension of the random variable Z? Now Z is a vector maybe, yeah? So in my picture, it was just a single value, but actually in general, Z is a vector. So as a nice example, consider here a model where the model primitives, say here my x of tk, are generated here by an Euler scheme. So now I'm interested in the sigma field t1. Yeah. So what is the information that I have at time t1? So assume that time t1 corresponds to little tm. So I have a time discretization here for my Euler scheme. And there is a time, little tm, that corresponds to time t1. So let's draw a small picture here. So this is time t2. This is time t1, where I would like to condition two. And then my Euler scheme has some time discretization, t0, t1, and so on. Yeah, so such that this t1 is now my tm. Yeah, all the randomness is generated by my Brownian increments. So when I would like to have full information of what has happened up to time little tm, so up to time t1, then I just need the information, what are the values of my Brownian increments? So my random variable z is actually the vector of all those Brownian increments from T0 up to Tm. Yeah? So the increments delta W of T0 up to delta W of Tm minus 1, because that's the last step from Tm minus 1 to Tm. So you see, uh, there is a natural understanding here in our Euler scheme, uh, what this random variable Z is that generates this Ft1. So I have the conditional expectation operator applied to some random variable conditional to ft1. This can be interpreted as being conditioned to the sigma field generated by a random variable z that contains all this inter information. And this is 
from the notation then just the same as the conditional expectation conditional to that random variable set. I would like to reduce the dimension of this random variable set yeah, because this random variable set can become actually very huge. You saw the number of time steps define the dimension of this random variable. And if you go back to this picture with the filtration, you see that I have some kind of curse of dimensionality. So here my random variable can only attend two different values. So this is the number of values that I can have yeah, if I have one time step. And every time step then creates a power. Yeah? So I have two to the power of one, two, two to the power of two, four, two to the power of three, eight. Yeah? Different configurations that can occur between T0 and T3. Yeah? These eight different configurations is the information. And now think that you have this situation in an Euler scheme yeah, that is generated by Brownian increments. So for example, go back to our little program where we simulated a Brownian motion. So we had here this Brownian motion sample path. So this is here our Brownian motion. And now also with the different values represented by dots yeah, on the left-hand side. And if you zoom in here, you see all these different values that now the Brownian motion attains. Yeah? And every transition from one of these values to the other is a piece of information in my filtration. So if you would have... 1,000 sample paths and you have three time steps, you have 1,000 to the power of three different ways of running through these values. But actually, the Monte Carlo simulation was breaking the curse of dimensionality. And of course, it is breaking the curse of dimensionality because not every point here is connected. Yeah? There's only one connection from one point to the next point. Yeah? So the point is that the benefit of the Monte Carlo simulation is now our problem. So we only have one sample path yeah, that moves from the point at time, say, ti, to the point at ti plus one. So if you think back at the section when we introduced the Monte Carlo method, we had this nice little heuristic here, how the probabilistic nature of the Monte Carlo method breaks the curse of dimensionality. So we have the we had this picture that the classical integration rule contains every combination of what you have in the first dimension and what you have in the second dimension. Yeah? So every combination of these values is here. And this is in this integration rule creating the curse of dimensionality. So the higher the dimension gets, the more points. I need, yeah, it grows exponentially. We had this little argument here that the benefit of the Monte Carlo method was actually to add a new random value in every component. So the way that we broke the curse of dimensionality here is now the problem when we would like to calculate conditional expectation. Yeah? For example, this conditional expectation here cannot be calculated because they're in the Monte Carlo simulation, there's just a single sample path. So I would like to reduce the dimension of the random variable Z. So in my Euler scheme, I can always take an M-dimensional random variable by considering every time step. We can reduce the dimension of this random variable depending on the nature of the guy for which we would like to calculate the conditional expectation. So this is now the point that this identity here also holds for a random variable Z where the sigma field generated by Z is smaller than the F of T1. Okay, how can that be? 
So if you know, for example, that your random variable is a function of just x of tk up to x of tn, say that tn is now the t2, you know, and the tk is some earlier point, then you can represent the conditional expectation of this random variable conditional to ft1, well, as conditional expectation, conditional to the sigma field generated by z, so that's just notation for conditional expectation of this random variable conditional to z, with a set being just x of tl, and the increments from tl you know, to tm. Yeah? So the delta w tl up to the delta w tm minus one, the last step from tm minus one to tm. Where the uh, l is the minimum of k, so the first time where I have a dependence here in this random variable, for which I would like to calculate the conditional expectation, and the m, yeah, so the m is the time I would like to condition on. Okay, let's illustrate what's going on here with a little picture. So here's time. So maybe here's time t2. So I would like to calculate the conditional expectation of the values that we observe here. Then I have time t1. This is here. My t1 is my tm. Okay, then there is also a tk. k can be smaller than m. So maybe my tk is here. But now I know that the value for which I would calculate the conditional expectation only depends on the value that I observe in time tk. Then some increments, okay, then I have some Brownian increments, maybe it goes up here and down here. And then I have reached time tm, yeah? so I'm going with my increments from time tl to time tm. And from that, yeah, I'm now calculating the conditional expectations. So we could say, okay, let's start here and calculate the condition expectation. So this means I already know that the value that I have in the end depends only on the quantities in tk, in tk plus one, in tk plus two, up to time tn. Of course, it also depends on all those guys here, but I'm conditioning these guys such that I know that the conditional expectation conditional to time t1 only depends on what I have observed between tk and tm. So it only depends on this information. So it does not play a role where we have run between 0 and tk. Yeah? So the past here is not relevant. So the dependency is only on these quantities. Of course, also on everything that is after that. You know? But now if I take the condition expectation, I know that I only have a dependency on this stuff here. So I can sometimes write the conditional expectation as a function of a random variable z that has a much smaller dimension. Yeah? The general case is where I just have everything that has happened in the past is part of this conditioning. Everything that is happen, hap, has happened in the past. You also see a special case. The special case where k is larger or equal m. Yeah? So where this payment here just depends on stuff that is after TM. For example, for a European option that just depends on the stock that pays here, 
yeah, in, in this case, you just have a dependency on the starting value on the x of tm. So this is a nice special case. Then my z is just the starting value. This was the situation which we had for the Bermudan option under our black Schultz model, where the Bermudan option has two exercise states. So I could represent the second option using a black Schultz mo model by a black Schultz formula, where we saw that the condition expectation was just a function of the starting value here, yeah, the, the value of the stock at the condition condition time. So we may reduce the dimension of this uh, random variable set. Well, note that x and our brown increments, they may be vectors. Yeah. So for example, for a model with a stock, yeah, the x is usually just a single element, yeah, single scalar in ds, the stock. But for an interest rate model, yeah, the x could be just an interest rate curve, different forward rates, it could be a vector. And also for a multi-factor model, the Brownian increments could be just a vector. Yeah? So when I write this here as a vector, yeah, this is actually a vector of a vector, so which had, has to be flattened. Yeah, So the dimension is the sum of the dimension of the element vectors. So the ability to reduce this dimension relies on the absence of path dependency. Yeah? So for the dimension reduction we observe here, so it's important that neither the coefficients in our numerical scheme nor the payoff function exhibit some uh, path dependency yeah, on the prior realizations. So this payoff here was assumed to be not dependent on the past here. So the way this path is running. So it just depends on, you know, in the lucky case, just hit this starting value or a few values here. An example is maybe an Asian option, which depends on a few observations. But also here, it was important that our Euler scheme had a little bit this property. The next value just depends on knowing the previous value uh, in the coefficients and also as a starting value and, and the Brownian increment. So all the information is contained in where you have started and what are the Brownian increments. So now we have a good understanding of the sigma field FT1 which we have in our condition. yeah, It can be interpreted as being generated by the random variable, which means it can be interpreted by the information which we have if we know the values that a certain random variable has. And depending on what we condition, we only require a very limited amount of information. For example, just the starting value at the condition time and so on. Example in an interest rate model, yeah, there you could have a vector that has much more entries like the all the interest rates yeah, that you observe. But also there, there is a really huge amount of reduction of the dimension yeah, of this random variable. So we will now describe methods how we can approximate, yeah, create this functional dependency. Also recapitulation, because I mentioned binning in the last uh, session, but let's go quickly through this. The first idea is binning. So now that we have this random variable, so assume I know a candidate for this random variable Z uh, that is describing the conditioning. Actually, an idea which is immediately transparent here from our experiment with the Bermudan option on a stock that has two exercise states yeah, in T1 and T2. We observe the stock in T1 and we would like to calculate the conditional expectation of what we get if we yeah, don't exercise 
conditional to time t1. And the Black Schultz formula already tells me that this is a function of just the value of the stock that I observe in time t1. So this here is my random variable set. So let's have a value little set here. I need to calculate the conditional expectation. Conditional expectation is the value of the Black Scholes formula using the value of the stock at that little z as the stock value in the Black Scholes formula. And this is the conditional expectation of all the values that you would get if you continue. Yeah, these values, they are now samples that lie here. Yeah, so conditional to that I have started here, what is the value? which I get if I continue. Right? This is now my value V2 of T2, Yeah, all these. And you see in a Monte Carlo simulation, there would be just maybe a single point. Yeah, This is the problem with the filtration. I do not have every combination of all points. I just have a single sample pass. So for every value that I have in T1, there's maybe just one sample that I have in T2. So like you see, for example, here on the outside, yeah, you see it very nicely. I have here this dot, yeah, and for this value of the stock here, there's only that value that I get if I continue. Yeah? There's just a single, single dot. I would like to calculate a conditional expectation, so I need maybe many. So what I do is I just create a kind of bin so I create here an interval around this epsilon neighborhood. And now I take all the dots that are around that and calculate the conditional expectation, conditional to being in this bin. And this conditional expectation is maybe just this constant value here. Okay, it is a constant yeah? approximating now all these guys here. And yeah, maybe it's a little bit off because we have a Monte Carlo error. So this was the idea of binning. We like to calculate the conditional expectation, condition to Z. Conditional expectation is a random variable on our sample path omega. And what we do is we approximate this by the conditional expectation of our random variable, conditional to Z being in the epsilon neighborhood, u epsilon, around z of that omega. This is here in my picture, this neighborhood here, and I'm now taking the expectation of all the red dots that are in this bin. So this u epsilon is a epsilon neighborhood. Well, a small um, improvement is instead of taking an epsilon neighborhood for every omega, yeah, because that would mean if I want have 1,000 sample paths, I always have to create 1,000 of such intervals and average the points that lie in these intervals. Yeah, I will average many, many different points. It's maybe nicer to have a disjoint partitioning of the whole domain. Yeah. So this means in this picture, I will, instead of creating epsilon neighborhoods, I will now create many different such disjoint. So I have a numerical experiment that does this. We will, we will look at this numerical experiment later. And you see here, I use 20 bins. Actually, the size of the bin the disjoint partitioning of my domain, yeah, so of my values of the stock. Yeah. The size is determined by how many sample points yeah, lie in this interval, which means that the bins that are here uh, yeah, around uh, the initial value, they are a little bit smaller than the bins that are far outside. And this is what you would get if you now use binning. Yeah? So you see, you get the different values of the conditional expectation. 
And you also see that you have some kind of wiggling, which is just a Monte Carlo error, uh, uh, which is still inside here because we have in every bin only a fraction of the number of sample paths and we have a limited amount of sample paths. Yeah? So there's a somewhat maybe large Monte Carlo error. But if we use this yeah, to make the decision, should we exercise or not? Yeah, yeah Maybe this is already okay because should we exercise or not is... The question, are we above the red line or are, you, are we below the red line? You see, there are some bins yeah, where we make a mistake in our decision. So, which is here, for example, the optimal way to switch between exercise and non-exercise is this point because the green line is the analytic solution. The green line is the Black Shores formula, is the analytic solution. But you see, the bins move above the red line roughly at the correct point. Yeah, there are small mistakes. Yeah, here is a little bit of a mistake. Yeah, and here I think maybe don't count. So if we move to these disjoint sets, uh, we actually define now a piecewise constant function. So my conditional expectation of my random variable, conditional to that the condition value z uh, is in this uh, bin. This defines now a constant. So I have that we have values hi's which correspond now to the bin uh, ui. Yeah? So the hi is the conditional expectation that we have here for our bin ui. Hence, I have a piecewise constant function a function of z, yeah, functional representation that describes my conditional expectation. So this is what is happening in the binning, binning. And again, you see the reduction of the dimension. The sigma field would be generated by the whole sample path yeah, up to that time t1. Yeah? So this is a different one than this one. But since the value only depends on what you observe in T1, all the sample paths that run through this bin contribute now to calculating the conditional um, expectation. Yeah, again, example, the valuation of a Bermudan option on the stock, say our example with just two exercise states, I have exercise state T1 and exercise state T2. In T1, I receive N times S of T1 minus K1. Into T2, I receive N2 times S of T2 minus K2. Yeah. Say, since I also have the option to never exercise, I could model this as receiving in time T2 the maximum of S of T2 minus K2 and zero. Yeah? So you clearly see I have an option on an option and to decide in time T1, whether I take here the underlying or not, I have to value the second option. So I have to calculate the conditional expectation of this payoff conditional to time T1. I take my Black Scholes model so this is here my Black Scholes model. And I know that this value, since this option here just depends on the value of the stock at time T2, it does not depend on anything before time T1. So I know that this depends only on the starting value the starting value and the increments, which I'm then conditioning out. So I have that I am interested in the conditional expectation of my payoff in time T2, conditional to, to the value of the stock in time T1. So this here is my random variable Z. So this random variable Z is not generating the sigma field FT1, but this identity holds that 
the value of the option at time t2 conditional to ft1, this is equal to the conditional expectation, conditional to the starting point. So I can use just a single number. I have a, reduced it to a one-dimensional quantity. So I have that I can now view. What do I get if I continue as a function of my underlying value of the stock? So this is exactly this picture here. So what you get if you continue as a function of what you have if you arrive in time T1 as a function of the stock. I know the analytic solution is the Black-Schultz formula, which is this line here, and the optimal point to exercise is then exactly here, yeah, where the payment of the underlying is above the value of the option if you don't exercise. So you see there's some kind of boundary. All the points on the left are queen here, yeah, which means you don't exercise. Uh, all the points on the right are red, which means you exercise. So now for binning, you would take your condition value and average over all the values that you observe from your continuation averaged over all the values that fall in, in your bin. So I have a small plot that does this, yeah, and you see, so these are here the piecewise constant values yeah, that we calculate for our bins. And here on the right, you see, for example, the distribution that we observe for this bin here. Yeah? So for this bin here, we observe actually many points here with large values, but uh, if you wonder why the expectation is here, yeah, this is also because there are many, many points creating a zero. Mm -hmm. Because this is what you get if you continue. Yeah? So this is this value here, and many sample paths, uh, if you start in S of T1, many sample paths have maybe the property where S of T2 is below the K2, where you get a zero. So there are many values here in the zero, and the average over all these guys is this bin. Okay, so and now comes a nice little step. I make now the binning a little bit more complicated. I rewrite it as a least square regression. The thing is that once we have done this, you immediately see how you can generalize the binning to a general linear regression. And this is really then a very powerful method. Because look, if you go back to, say, this picture, which I used as a motivation of the bin, we are constructing a piecewise constant function, like that or like that. But to be accurate, I need maybe many different bins, yeah? say 10, 20, maybe a higher number. But if I use many different bins, I have that every bin only contains few Monte Carlo sample paths. Yeah? So if you have 10,000 Monte Carlo sample paths and 100 bins, then one bin contains in average only 100 Monte Carlo sample paths. So you have only very few sample paths to calculate the condition expectation. So this is a disadvantage. And maybe I would like to describe my function with fewer parameters. So you immediately see here some kind of cloud. Maybe there is some other function that I can choose instead of a piecewise constant function, maybe just some kind of polynomial, you know? something that fits to these points. So let's consider the binning again. What we are doing is we calculate the conditional expectation, conditional to our random variable z lying in, in a bin ui. And now there is an alternative way of characterizing expectation and that also carries over to conditional expectation. And this is that the expectation is the quantity that is minimizing 
the L2 distance to the values that you observe. So we can characterize the expectation operator as a least square approximation. So the claim is, given a random variable x of which you would like to calculate the conditional expectation or expectation, yeah? let's consider for a while just the expectation. Then the expectation is the number h for which x minus h has the smallest L2 norm. Okay, proof. Huh? So let x be a random variable and let h be just a real number. Huh? So this is now expectation. So now let's look at the L2 norm of x minus h. So this is the expectation of x minus h squared. Huh? So this is, uh, it is expectation of x minus h multiplied with x minus h. So this is expectation of x squared minus two times expectation of x times h plus h squared. So this is a function of h. I would like to minimize this. Okay, where is this guy attaining its minimum? Differentiate this becomes here a two times h, and this becomes a minus two times expectation of x yeah, equal to zero. So you see that this takes its minimum at h is equal to expectation of x. Okay, this is now an alternative way of describing the expectation. Uh, expectation at the quantity h that minimizes the distance to the points that we observe, yeah, to the axis in the L2 norm. If you go back to our little binning example, yeah, you can interpret this now as follows. You draw here a line h, a candidate, and then from every red dot, yeah, you calculate the distance to this guy. Okay. And now you minimize yeah, the position of this h. And if you have found it here, then this is equal to the expectation that we look at. So now I can write my binning as a minimization problem. And at first, this looks as if I have made everything much more complicated. But in the end, you will see that there is um, a nice generalization step uh, possible now. So using our little lemma that the expectation can be interpreted as a minimization problem, I can now write my binning in an alternative way. Yeah? So my value in this bin so my hi, which is the conditional expectation corresponding to z being in the bin ui, this is just the minimum over all possible values g. Take the distance, yeah. so take the expectation of the random variable for, for which we would like to calculate the conditional expectation minus that g conditional to z being in my bin. Okay, so this is now the definition of this hi. Yeah? hi is the value that minimizes this distance. But now since all the bins are disjoint, minimizing bin ui is independent from minimizing bin uj. So since all the bins are disjoint, we can write this as a single minimization problem. So I have now a vector hi, and the vector hi I'm looking for is the vector for which the sum of the distance of the value v divided by n from this hi is minimizing this L2 distance. Yeah, so I take the minimum over all such vectors g, take the difference v minus gi that you observe on your bin ui. From there, take the square 
and the expectation here, so the L2 norm, and minimize all the, those guys. Yeah, so take the minimizing GIs, and this defines your HI. In other words, the thing that we are looking for, and now move to this other picture. The thing that I'm looking for is the piecewise constant function, piecewise constant on the bins UI, such that the L2 norm, the difference between the continuation values and this piecewise constant function is minimized. So I'm looking now not for a value in a bin, I'm looking now for a minimizing piecewise constant function. So let's H be the space of all functions, the functions that are piecewise constant on my bins, so the inverse of UI. Yeah? Uh, so the H is in the uh, in the image space. Also note that this this implies yeah that this function is ft1 measurable yeah, because it is generated by values that I observe in Z. So this means if you have a sample path omega from say the bin UI, so where Z of omega is in UI, then H on this sample path omega has the value HI. So if script H is this set of all functions, this is now actually the set of all functions which are yeah, F, FT1 measurable and piecewise constant, then my minimization problem with the binning is just equivalent to find the function H out of the set of all functions G such that H minimizes this this distance yeah? conditional to Z. Okay, this is just now a complicated way of say finding these piecewise constant values. So finding the conditional expectation in each bin. Yeah, but now you see that we could just drop here um, a little assumption. Maybe we don't need this assumption that this is a piecewise constant function on some bins. Yeah, So we can drop all this. And we just need that the function that is inside the space H is FT1 measurable. And this is now the regression method, the least square Monte Carlo. So actually I would say the method to estimate a conditional expectation in the Monte Carlo simulation. So the partitioning of our state space yeah, of the different values that can be attained by our random variable Z. If you would like to have an example, the random variable Z was the value of the stock at time T1. So all the different values the stock can attain at time T1 are discretized. Yeah? If you would like to improve from this discretization into a finite number of bins that result in the this piecewise constant functions, a natural improvement is just to consider a smooth function of our random variable Z. So this is like Instead of here considering a piecewise constant function of S, well, this special version here with 20 bins, or here with just 10 bins, maybe I can just use some kind of polynomial function, a polynomial function in S. This one here is a polynomial function with five monomials, C0 plus C1 times S plus C2 two times s squared plus three three times s to the power of three plus c four times s to the power of four. Yeah? So maybe I could just consider such a function and this has five degrees of freedom, five unknowns, and find the best fitting function that reduces the L2 norm. And you see that this is not the correct solution. The correct solution is the green line. 
but this is actually giving you a very good prediction of should you exercise or not. Yeah, it is here at this point, yeah, almost in line with the analytic solution and give you the correct exercise criteria. So the exercise criteria is switch from exercise to non-exercise when the stock is below or above this point. So let's, let us start with a very general uh, definition of the least square approximation. So what we like to calculate is the conditional expectation of some random variable u. So my random variable u is now the guy that is not necessarily ft1 measurable. I would like to calculate the conditional expectation conditional to time t1. So now I need some kind of predictor variable. So this is the role of my z. Yeah? So maybe my predictor variables are now the y1 to yp. And these are all ft1 measurable. In addition, assume now I have a function that consumes these predictor variables, yeah? so it's a function of RP, but also consumes a parameter, say a parameter alpha, alpha 1 to alpha Q. So then I have here this function F. This is a function of my predictor variable Y, which is FT1 measurable, and this parameter alpha. And now I like to minimize over all possible values of this alpha, the L2 distance of my random variable u and the function f of y with that alpha. Finding the minimizing alpha gives me now an alpha star. And the claim is that now f of y and alpha star, this is my conditional expectation. F of y and alpha star is my conditional expectation. Yeah, clearly, the y is ft1 measurable. So this means a function of an ft1 measurable random variable is also ft1 measurable. So this guy here is ft1 measurable. What am I doing? Among all ft1 measurable random variables that I can generate with this alpha, so maybe I cannot generate all the random variables that I need, yeah? So I cannot generate all the information that I need. That depends a little bit on which predictor functions, uh, which predictors I have chosen. Do I have chosen the right predictors? And which function have I chosen? Have I chosen the right function? Mm -hmm. Among all those FT1 measurable random variables that are generated by this function F as a function of alpha, I use that one that is minimizing the L2 distance from my random variable u. So this guy is then an approximation to the conditional expectation of this random variable u conditional to ft1. There is a special case where this f is just a linear function. But this is sometimes also called Longstaff-Schwarz method, although the two guys were not the first one to do it, yeah, but they had a very nice paper. And this then gives us a linear regression. And using a linear function is very nice because then I can calculate this solution here. The alpha that minimizes this stuff so I can calculate the alpha star uh, with just a little bit of linear algebra. So the linear regression is the special case where my function f of my ft1 measurable predictor variables and my parameter alpha, this function is now just a linear function, a linear combination. So it's alpha i times yi. So maybe for your intuition, the yi could be the value of the stock or the constant or the value of the stock squared. 
Yeah, always the value of the stock observed in T1 because it has to be an FT1 measurable random variable. And then the alpha i's are just coefficients of these monomials. So if y1 is just equal to one, y2 is just equal to f of t1, and y3 is just equal to s of t1 squared, then you see that this is a quadratic polynomial in the stock. So your minimization is among all quadratic portfolios as a function of the stock, find the one that minimizes the L2 distance. This is what I do in this numerical experiment. Yeah, The blue line is actually just the constant that is minimizing the L2 distance. Well, the constant, yeah, so you see this is here n equals 1, yeah, just one of these monomials. The constant is just a trivial case where I calculate the expectation. Yeah, Which constant is minimizing the L2 distance to all the points? This is just the expectation. If I just have a linear function, so n is equal to 2, I have a function that is a function of a constant and the stock. This is now the blue line the linear function that minimizes the L2 distance. You see that I make the exercise decision, which is where I cross this red line at the wrong point. Yeah? Here, the analytic solution is here. I made the exercise decision at a slightly wrong point, but I'm not so bad. If you use n equals four, you are already very good. So the nice thing if I use a linear function is that I can now calculate here this minimization problem analytically. Yeah. So find here the minimizing alpha such that the L2 norm of u minus f of y and alpha is minimized. Claim is the solution alpha star is now given by x transposed x alpha star equals x transposed u. So solve this linear equation. Yeah, this is our alpha star, where the x is the matrix consistent of our predictor variables on the sample path. So note this here is an number of sample paths times p matrix so i have very long columns yeah and the u is the vector of the random variable u on my sample path yeah, i'm i'm calculating in my monte carlo simulation so i only have my sample paths i'm averaging over the sample paths yeah. so this here is a vector that has size number of sample path if x transposed x is invertible, this means that alpha star is equal to x transposed x inverse times x transposed u. This looks like a big calculation, but note that x transposed x is column times column. Yeah? It is the sc scalar product of all the columns. This is actually a small matrix if the number of predictor variables is small. This is a P times P matrix. So this is the projection of the vector U on your predictor variables. So actually this is, what is the correlation of U with your predictor variables if you would take an expectation? Mm -hmm. So this is removing the non-FT1 measurability from the random variable u. And this is actually just some uh, renormalization uh, in case your predictor variables have not uh, variance one and are um, uh, correlated. If your predictor variables are independent and have all variance one, this, here, this matrix is just an identity. Okay, so you see your alpha star is just how much has u in common with your predictor variable x. Okay, so here's the proof. 
Yeah, I would like to minimize this L2 norm here. So U minus F of Y and alpha, okay. I can now write this using my vector and matrix notation. So this is a linear function. So I can write the f of y and alpha, I can just write it as x times alpha. Okay, so this then means this is just u minus x times alpha, yeah, squared, yeah, so this is u minus x times alpha transposed times u minus x times alpha. I would like to minimize this. So let's differentiate with respect to alpha. If you differentiate this guy with respect to alpha, you get an x a minus x transposed times u minus x times alpha. Uh, and due to symmetry, I get it twice. So minus two times x transposed u minus x transposed x times alpha, huh? set it to zero, and you see that this is the equation that we have to solve. Yeah? So the solution that is minimizing this is the alpha for which x transposed x alpha is equal to x transposed u. This is now a very simple way of approximating the conditional expectation. Yeah? Go back here. If I have now found this alpha star, I just plug it into the function again, and I have my conditional expectation. So if we have found the alpha star, say for example, in the case where it is invertible, where x transposed x is invertible, this means the conditional expectation of my random variable u, yeah, now conditional to ft1, this is now approximated by x transposed alpha star. Yeah, plug the alpha star into the f again. x transposed alpha star, and alpha star is x transposed x inverse x transposed u. So you have some nice operator that you have just to throw on this vector u to get the conditional expectation. These guys are sometimes called the basis functions or explanatory variables. Yeah, example, you can now do this for our Bermudan option on the stock. So this is now everything put together, the backward algorithm you calculate the value of your underlying. Okay. You initialize your random variable from the backward algorithm. Now your task is to calculate the conditional expectation of this random variable. This is now done with our x transposed x inverse applied to this random variable. Yeah, so I know now know that the conditional expectation is x trans x times x transposed x inverse times x transposed applied to this random variable. And then I can use this random variable, which is my approximation of the conditional expectation to compare it to the underlying, yeah, to update my random variable u. Yeah, so I get now the u at the next time point by either choosing the underlying or choosing the u from the previous time point. Yeah? And you see the conditional expectation estimator, the conditional expectation estimator, which is this guy here, is only in the decision criteria. Okay, here are a few figures. Let's skip these. And I can also now write my binning as a linear least square regression. So this is very simple. My basis functions for the binning are just the indicator functions. 
the indicator functions that are one on the corresponding bin are now the predictor variables, the basis functions that create the binning. Yeah? Clearly, I'm minimizing among all piecewise constant functions, piecewise constant on the bin, and the linear combinations of these guys here will create all piecewise constant functions that are piecewise constant on the bins. So then I get such a picture for binning. Let's conclude with a small remark and then I show you uh, the code. There is something called the foresight bias and that is related to the following issue. Actually, the approximation that we calculate here for our conditional expectation, so apply the function to our predictor variables yeah, with this optimal parameter alpha star, our conditional operator here, the true one, we only get a lower bound. Yeah, why do I get a lower bound? Because I'm minimizing over a set of functions where I do not know if the set of functions is sufficient to generate all information that is here in the sigma field FT1. Yeah? But this is only true if you neglect the Monte Carlo error. Because a subtle issue is that in your estimate, there is a Monte Carlo error and you will base your decision on that error. So you have some knowledge of the future. So go back to our example with the perfect foresight. So if you just have the two sample paths you have information about the future, you can exercise super optimally. And an information about the future that you have here is that you know about the Monte Carlo error if it has a bias high or bias low. So you will favor you know, in continuation if you know that the future values have a bias high and you will favor into exercise if you know that the future values have a bias low. So to remove this, actually there's a simple trick. You have to calculate the estimate for your alpha star using a Monte Carlo simulation with basis functions Y, superscript one, and then use an independent Monte Carlo simulation and then use the estimated optimal function on these independent variables. So you use your alpha star on that, and this is then the conditional expectation in the second Monte Carlo simulation. So you decouple the error from the estimate to the error that you do in the prediction. So let's conclude with a very small code session here you find actually a link to an implementation of our Monte Carlo expectation by regression. And you find this here, but you can also go to the Bermudan option implementation. So this is here in products. So here it is our Bermudan option code. And this was the implementation of the backward algorithm. So we go backward over all exercise times. Yeah, We take the value of the underlying and we need to calculate the conditional expectation of this random variable u that we update by going backward in time. Okay, so and you see there is here a Monte Carlo conditional expectation regression. This is a conditional expectation estimator, and you can then just ask this estimator, okay, give me the conditional expectation of this random variable. So this estimator is initialized with a set of basis functions. And what is he doing? Yeah, we can have a look into the code. So what is he doing? Actually, he's just calculating this solution, x transposed x, yeah, times alpha is equal x transposed times u. So let's have a look 
at the first step. So we built the matrix X transposed X. Yeah. So we have number of basis functions times number of basis functions. So this is a P by P matrix. So I my basis function is just a vector of random variables. Let's have a look at this. Yeah. So my regression basis function is just a vector of random variables. So I can use our very nice random variable implementation. And an entry of this matrix is just the scalar product of two of such random variables, two columns. Yeah. So I just calculate xi times xj or yi times yj, and from that, the expectation. This is my matrix x transposed x ij. It's a symmetric matrix, so I only need to calculate the triangle. Then I calculate the projection x transposed y. Yeah? So this is the dependence vector multiplied with the basis functions, yeah? also just the scalar product. And then I'm solving this equation. So this here is a singular value decomposition solver that I use. Yeah from some library, and I calculate the alpha. If I have the alpha, I get back here, yeah, and I calculate now x times alpha. Actually, I can calculate x times alpha with a different set of random variables. This here is the basis functions estimator, and the basis functions predictor could be two different ones, but I often use it with the same, same ones. So this is here my implementation of the Bermudan. Actually, the Bermudan has here different sets of basis functions. For example, you see, I use just the monomials as, so as basis functions, I just use the constant one, s, s squared, or s to the power of three. But I can also do binning. If I use regression basis functions binning, then he will just create these, indicator functions where actually the size of the bin is adapted to the fact that every bin should have the same number of sample paths. Yeah? So I have smaller bins where I have many sample paths. I have a little experiment that does this. Yeah, So you find this here in Bermuden experiments. So the first thing our review of the Bermudan option, okay, that we just did. Yeah, you see that there is this conditional expectation estimator. And now let's have a look at here this experiment, which will create different such plots or different Bermudan option valuations using our regression method. Yeah, so this is here in experiments. Bermuden option experiments, so you can run this guy. Oh, let's first look at the code. Let's look at the code quickly. Yeah. So I generate here different basis functions, different bins, 10 bins, 20 bins, 100 bins, uh, different polynomial functions in S in the stock. Okay. And here you see uh, the code. Yeah. Um, I just use my Black-Scholes model, my Brownian motion, my Euler scheme to generate the model. And then I generate the Bermudan option yeah, with the corresponding uh, set of uh, basis functions. And below I do some plotting of the value which I get if I exercise, the value if I get if I continue. I also plot the analytic um, approximation, which in the case of the Black Schultz model, I know. Uh, I create a few plots. So let's run this guy. And it prints a little bit here the valuation of the Bermuden. So you see I'm becoming more accurate here. And it creates these plots. And actually, these plots, these are the plots that you already have in uh, in the script. Yeah. So binning with a different number of bins and different monomials, 10, 5, 4, 2, the linear one, and the constant one. 
these are the pictures that you have here in the script. Huh? So regression with just a constant is just the expectation. Regression with a linear function, okay, poor estimate of the exercise criteria, but maybe not so bad. Four monomials, yeah, so up to the power of three, already a very high quality estimate of the conditional expectation, a little bit poorer here on the outside, yeah, but actually there it is not relevant, it's only relevant there where I would like to make my decision. You have to be a little bit careful if you have too many basis functions, you can get it kind of overfitting, yeah, so this here is actually 10 monomials, yeah, and it's maybe a bad idea, yeah? So reducing the dimension is actually a good idea, yeah? Or the same with binning, 10 bins. Yeah? You see, I make a mistake here, okay? So I'm actually here, I'm above the red line, so I'm not exercising but actually I should exercise because the red line is above the analytic solution, the green line. So I get more if I exercise. So I'm doing a mistake here. So here I'm exercising. So in every bin, I make maybe sometimes small wrong decisions, Yeah, but the bin becomes more accurate as I become to the region where I have more sample paths. So here, for example, the decision based on the bin, bins is quite good. Yeah, also that one is quite good. Okay, using more bins will make maybe the approximation of the function better, but it also increases the Monte Carlo error. So you have a problem. If you have more bins, you have an increase in the Monte Carlo error for each estimate. So this is also kind of overfitting. Yeah. So if you have 10,000 sample paths and 100 bins, every bin gets just 100 sample paths and has a very poor approximation. So reducing the number of basis functions, this is true for bins, because it is reducing the number of bins, but also for polynomial approximations, yeah, because it creates overfitting. That was it for today. Thanks. <laughs>